Part one, introduction. Mark's mother. Hello, my name is Muriel Lehner, and I'm coordinating director of the Nonfiction at the Food Court reading series here at the Wood Creek Plaza Mall. This series has been made possible by the generosity of the International Council of Shopping Centers and Do That and Associates Properties. And I'd like to single out Jenny Schoenhals, the Senior General Manager at Wood Creek Plaza Mall, who has worked so diligently on providing us with such a commodious venue here at the food court, and without whom none of this would be possible. I see you couldn't make it tonight, but thank you so very much, Jenny, wherever you are. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank our indispensable sponsors, Panda Express, Master Walk, Au Bon Pain, Auntie Anne's Pretzels, California Pizza Kitchen, Cinnabon, Jamba Juice, KFC Express, McDonald's, Nathan's Famous, Subaru, Subway, and Taco Bell. Before I introduce our reader for tonight, I should point out that because of the heavy rain and the flash flood warnings that have been issued by the National Weather Service, no one, not one single person, has actually shown up for the reading, except uh, I see that we've got some of the staff of Panda Express and Sabaro with us. I don't know if you two guys are just taking a break over there or are actually here for the reading. Panda Express worker. We're just taking a break. We're definitely not here for the reading. Mark's mother. Well, welcome. There's nothing more dispiriting for a writer than to have traveled hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles to give a reading and then find him or herself facing rows of empty seats. So I'm especially appreciative that you guys braved such inclement weather and at least showed up for work tonight. At least it provides the semblance of an audience. I've survived two assassination attempts, one on a highway between Sofia and Plovdiv, Bulgaria on November 11th, 2006, and one in front of a hotel in Los Angeles on February 4th, 2008. On December 3rd, 2012, I was raped by a robot on the corner of 5th Avenue and 101st Street in New York City. In the summer of 2014, desperate for cash and back on crack, I sold the rights to my life story to a startup indie video game developer called Mirage Entertainment, named after its founders, Miriam Rubenstein and Devesh Rajaratnam. So begins Gone with the Mind, my son's autobiography, excerpts from which he will be reading tonight. Mark Lehner was born at the Margaret Haig Maternity Hospital in Jersey City, New Jersey, on January 4th, 1956, I was 21 years old. During my pregnancy, Mark's father, my ex-husband, Joel, and I were living in a one-bedroom apartment in a small brick building at 225 Union Street in Jersey City, between Bergen Avenue and the Boulevard. We paid, as I remember, $50 a month in rent. I don't know why I remember all that so exactly, perhaps because it was our very first apartment. At any rate... About five or six weeks into the pregnancy, I began experiencing terrible, terrible morning sickness. Severe morning sickness. This was at the end of April in 1955. I would throw up all day and all night. The medical term for this is hyperemesis gravidarum. And I lost a significant amount of weight. I was down to something ridiculous like 85 pounds. My obstetrician gynecologist, my obgyn, although we didn't abbreviate it back then, was a man named Dr. Schneckendorf. This Dr. Schneckendorf, interestingly enough, had been my own mother's doctor when she gave birth to me in 1934, and he was a kindly old gent. But nobody really helped with the nausea. Most men, and I'd say especially doctors, looked on it as a form of self-indulgence. I valiantly tried to do everything humanly possible to keep it under control, but... People really thought of it as some sort of psychosomatic malady, almost like a form of malingering, as if I were simply the spoiled Jewish princess. That's the overwhelming feeling I got from most men, and certainly from most men in the medical profession at that time. 
At about three months, I began to, quote, feel life, end of quote, which is the expression we used then for a mother's first sensations of the fetus moving around in her uterus. And I could see an outline of his leg sticking out on my right side. He was a very high baby, and I remember being dismayed by what people said, and that when you feel life, the nausea would abate, because that certainly didn't come to pass for me. I was going to NYU at the time. I was finishing up my sophomore year, I think. My father, at one point, had refused to continue paying for my school. He said to me, well, you went and got married so young, and now you need to go out and work, and you and your husband need to take care of your own financial obligations. I'm not taking care of you anymore. So I went and got a job at a moving and storage company on Ocean Avenue in Jersey City, where I did billing and secretarial work, and I was terrible at it. Terrible. And I went and told my father that I just couldn't stand being cooped up in that office on Ocean Avenue anymore, and he relented and changed his mind and agreed to help pay for NYU again. But it was very, very difficult for me at that point, given how sick I was feeling, just about all the time, throwing up every single day, all day long. And I was missing exams, and I was taking incompletes. And I had no choice but to drop out, essentially. But my husband and I wanted a baby very, very much, and it was also a good time to get pregnant to protect him from the draft. This was only a couple of years after the Korean War. So I tried the best I could to just buck up and get through it. I kept a bowl cradled in one arm to throw up in. I'd spend days at my mother Harriet's house, or she would come over to my house. Afternoons were better, a little better. And I'd try to eat. Chinese food, fried rice, seemed to set better in my stomach. And Mark's father, after work, would stop at the Jade, which was a Chinese restaurant in Journal Square, and bring me cartons of fried rice. Whenever I felt that I could actually eat something, actually keep something down, I could be very peremptory about it. I remember that summer being down at the Jersey Shore at a beach club in Long Branch and barking at my sister Frances, get me a well-done hamburger and fries now! Because I knew how fleeting that appetite could be and I was absolutely determined to try to stay as healthy and as strong as I possibly could for this baby inside me. That summer, we were staying at these little apartments in West Long Branch. There were lots of Jersey City people. And almost every day, the men would go out on fishing boats, and there were rough seas out there. And later in the afternoon, when these guys would get off the boats, they were green, staggering. And I'd say, Dr. Rubenstein, Uncle Harry, what happened? I was a fresh kid. I had a fresh mouth. Uncle this and Uncle that, what happened out there? You don't look so good. The fact that they were so seasick, so nauseous, delighted me to no end because as far as they were concerned, my terrible, relentless nausea was all in my mind. If you kept yourself busy, maybe if you had more floors to wash. They were all such imperious chauvinists. If you continue this, we're going to have to put you in the hospital and feed you intravenously. Believe me, if this were an ailment of men's testicles, they would have found a treatment, a cure for it a thousand years ago. But they didn't give a flying fuck. I got vitamin B shots from a doctor who was a friend of my husband, and that helped a bit, but that's about it. Other women would tell me that morning sickness was a sign of a healthy pregnancy, which was certainly a consolation. And I think that I endured it all with a genuine sense of martyrdom, determined to persevere in the face of all the sexist, condescending bullshit for the sake of my baby, for Mark's sake. And so, that first week in January of 1956, the third, on a Tuesday, my water broke. And Dr. Schneckendorf said, come right into the hospital. I remember it was snowy, and I had my little bag with me. And Schneckendorf and all the residents told me, what you need to do is walk. Walk up and down on the hall. So I walked up and down on the hall. I had my robe. A pale blue and white printed corduroy robe with white linen, embroidered collar and cuffs, buttoned down the front, like a college girl's. Slippers, long, fair hair and a ponytail. And I'm walking, walking, walking. And the pain is getting a bit worse, but I'm thinking, this actually isn't so bad. It's like bad cramps. And the sallow looking young man appears and he says, hello. I thought, that's strange. What are you doing here? He asked in his very 
thick Italian accent. I thought that was obvious. I'm in labor. What are you doing here? I'm an anesthesiologist, he replied. He was flirting with me. I thought that was the funniest thing. Imagine making a pass at a pregnant woman in a maternity ward. I suppose men just think they can make use of their position whenever the whim strikes them. And women should think it's wonderful that they think you're sexy. I love it, the green-eyed blondes, he said to me in his accent. Several hours later, I was screaming at the top of my lungs and I knew what real labor was, what real pain was. And at three o'clock in the morning, after 12 hours of labor with no painkillers until the very end, this nice, little, perfectly round head emerged. I was ecstatic at the sight of him. I was thrilled and happy and delighted. I was as overjoyed as a human being can be. From the moment I looked at him, I knew how wonderful he was and would always be. It was just this atavistic thrill. It was physical and emotional. My mother came to see us that morning and she held him. And then the next day when I woke up, I brushed my hair and brushed my teeth. And I looked up and there was that young man again, the Italian anesthesiologist. And he had a bouquet of flowers. And again, this struck me as very, very amusing. Mario, his name was Mario. He was from a titled family in Italy and he'd only been in the US for a short period of time. It was the beginning of a funny friendship. He met Mark's father. He was a typical mad Italian driver. He had these Italian sports cars and got into frequent accidents. Mark's father, who had recently graduated from law school and was clerking for a judge at the time, would help this Mario with the legal ramifications of all his numerous car accidents. It was clear that he liked the way I looked and liked the way I spoke, that he thought I was a cut above the typical people he saw. When I look back, these aren't things I'm particularly fond of, that kind of class snobbery and being such a big flirt. Anyway, it was a week's stay in the hospital in those days. That was just the protocol then. And there I was, this thin, fragile looking girl, but I was strong. I'd walk around and stand in front of the nursery window. And I could always immediately tell which card he was in, those skinny, naked, red legs. They'd bring the baby every four hours to be fed, bottle fed. I didn't nurse. His circumcision was scheduled for the last day of that week, the bris with a mole. And I was extremely anxious about that on every level. I'm very concerned about cleanliness. The idea of some old geezer with his own equipment filled me with foreboding. But I was reassured by Harry Gurner, the pediatrician, and my, by my parents and by my in-laws. I had another issue, though. I have very serious problems with clotting. I have a genetic inability to clot properly and almost died getting my tonsils out when I was 10. I had massive hemorrhaging. So I demanded that before they even think of performing Mark's circumcision, they get a clotting time done. I insisted on it. And they did, and it was normal. And they had the bris in a special room. I don't remember if I was wearing clothes or my robe. And all the grandparents were there, and it all went perfectly well, and the next day we went home. I can regale you with all the ensuing milestones. At 10 days, he raised his head and rolled over. At six weeks, he giggled. At about five months, he could crawl backwards, shake his head no, and play hide-and-seek. He stood up all alone and got his first teeth at six months. At six and a half months, he stood up all alone holding onto the crib. He took his first steps holding onto his playpen at seven months. He said his first word, Dada, at eight months and walked all by himself at 11 months. His favorite toys were a set of colored discs on a chain and a stuffed, fuzzy cocker spaniel that his uncle Richie gave him. Because I dutifully recorded all of this critical information in a white satin-bound baby diary, in which I also inscribed the following account of his first birthday. Mark had a birthday party on Sunday, the 6th of January, and we took movies of him and all the family. Both grandmas and grandpas, great-grandmas and great-grandpas were there. And his aunts and uncles, too. 
He received beautiful gifts, put both fists in the cake, cried at the company, and later in the evening performed for them and for the camera. By the following year, 1958, we'd moved to an apartment complex, a middle-income co-op called College Towers in the Greenville section of Jersey City. Mark was a toddler, two years old, and one afternoon we were uh, sitting outside in a sort of semicircular area of plantings out in front of our building. It was a new building and there were benches there and it had to have been springtime or early summer because for some silly reason. I even remember what I was wearing. I was sitting there with him and I was in shirt sleeves. I had on the style of the day for sportswear, sort of man-tailored stuff, you know, very preppy. You wore Bermuda shorts and they didn't have a crease pressed in. They had a crease sort of stitched in and khaki and um, loafers. I guess they were penny loafers. You put a diamond, I forget why. And a blue man-tailored shirt with the sleeves rolled up, a button down, and that was sort of the style of the time for college girls and for a um, well-dressed young woman. I was sitting there, long hair and a ponytail, feeling very happy and proud of him, my beautiful, wonderful, amazing boy, and happy with the weather and so on, and all of a sudden a little truck drove up, really small. And attached to the back of it was a slightly larger, uh, sort of little caboose thing, and on it was a small merry-go-round, a little gadget that sort of went in a circle. And when I looked at it, the first thing I thought was, boy, that's an awfully small circle to be going around in. There were other mothers out there and other kids playing with each other, and they all heard the little truck played a tune, I think. There was some way for everyone to know what it was and what it was for, and the older children ran for it, and then the little kids, like Mark, and the moms walked toward it, and the people were getting on and paying, and he said to me, very clearly to me, that he wanted to get on, and I said, oh, okay, sweetie, we're, we're going to do that right now. And the guy from the truck, the guy who operated the merry-go-round, said hello to me, and um, I said hi back, and I was much more interested in putting Mark in safely. There were a couple of kids already on it. I put you in the little seat, and I was trying to figure out how to hook the little belt on you, and I see the guy go to sit in the front of the car and start something, and I started to say whatever I said to him. Uh, hey, mister, sir, wait, wait just a minute, just a minute or two, please. I'm just putting him in. And he kept saying things like, that's okay, honey, that's okay, girly. You can have a ride. And I kept saying, no, you don't understand. No, I, I need to get off. This is my little boy. I'm just putting him on. And he started it. The music was starting and he was still saying that. All right, honey. All right, girly. And all I could think of was that I was going to be dizzy and probably throw up. And one could say I talked myself into it, but the truth is I know my nature and I knew I couldn't do that. And the circle was so small, I knew nothing good was going to come out of that for me. And he thought... I don't know why I'm so sure of this, but I am. He thought that I was the babysitter. I was dressed like a teenager. And he thought I was a teenager. And what was I anyway? 23 years old? So, And I just kept saying to him, can you stop it now? And then you'll start it again. And he kept saying, that's okay, honey. That's all right, girly. You can, uh, it's all right. It's a free ride for you. And when it ended and I took Mark off there, the world was still going round and round for me. And I was so nauseous and so dizzy. And he had had such a good time and he did not want to go inside with me. He wanted to go on that ride again. But I had to take him inside and I had to go lie down for a few minutes because to that guy, I might have been girly and honey and it was okay, but it was pretty awful for me. So that's the story of the merry-go-round. I usually think of myself as a very friendly, gregarious person, but thank the heavens I never saw that man again. The people who lived directly below us, we were on the second floor of our building. They were on the first were from somewhere in New York, and she had a very definite Brooklyn or Bronx accent, and they were not particularly educated people. They were working class people, and I think she worked, and she became very friendly. Um, I was, as I said, I tried to be friendly with everyone, but I wasn't looking to, you know, have relationships where I was obligated to spend time with other people. I felt very keenly my responsibility for my little boy and my desire was to spend as much time as possible with him, but it was all very pleasant and cordial with my neighbors. And there were no true problems except with this woman downstairs who I thought was very warm and loving and friendly to me, but who behaved very badly. Mark was usually up very early in the morning. He was never a great sleeper, never, ever, never, ever. And just when I thought I had had it made, that we had gotten past getting up during the night, he would get... Um, 
a runny nose or his schedule would be off because we went on a holiday or something and we'd start sort of all over again. He spoke very early and he spoke very clearly and I would hear, Mommy, and it could be the middle of the night and I would come in and talk to him and sometimes get him. And um, This time in particular that I'm thinking of, he had his first real cold. And I know that he was then, I guess, either three and a half or four because he went to the... Uh, Jewish Community Center to the nursery school. And that was the first experience he had, first experience he had had with a real infection from the other kids. Because otherwise, he was pretty much protected from that kind of thing. And to tell you the truth, there were many times that I decided not to send him. Either he wasn't better from a sniffle, or Harry Gurner, his pediatrician, whom I called Uncle Harry, and who was my father's best friend, and who had also been my pediatrician, would say to me, must he go there? Because Mark would almost invariably get ear infections after he had a cold, so it was a very sort of divided up experience. <laughs>